Well, I came here 20 years ago and have absolutely been amazed and enthralled by the history here. So this is your history. There are people in this room who probably know infinitely more about some of the people we're going to be talking about than I do. If you've got some corrections for me, please tell me. <laughs> this, this is the, the electric light show, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> We are a, we are we have a, have a, a depth of entertainment for you today. <laughs> uh, the picture that you see here, I, I just think this face is wonderful. This is Duff Green Thornburg. His picture is downstairs in our collection here at the McClung. Uh, I don't think it's anywhere else. His family donated this picture. On the back, it says in pencil, Uncle Duff, the beard. You can see why. And of course, this is post-Civil War, but Uncle Duff was a lieutenant colonel in the cavalry, the Union cavalry, and we have his revolver here. I'll get into that a little bit longer, but I am fascinated by the faces of the people, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I've got to do a little bit of promotion beforehand. Uh, Knox County, uh, in November, appointed a sesquicentennial commission. That word sesquicentennial is not an easy one. It's not easy to say, it's not easy to spell, but it does mean 150th. This is our logo. We also have a website. We're working together with all, all of us in the uh, history business, so to speak, are working together. So the McClung Museum will reference us and we'll reference them. But our website is knoxcivilwar.org. Org. <laughs> um, this one is uh, devoted to all things Civil War here in the Knox area um, and a calendar. We will be compiling everything that has a Civil War component on our calendar so that you can go there onto this website and look up what's, being, uh, what's happening on a particular weekend. Um, we're trying, we've got a wonderful concert coming up. I won't go through everything, but at the Unitarian Church, uh, Tennessee Valley Unitarian Church, the consort of uh, Newberry consort from Chicago is going to be playing Little Herd 1860s music. It should be a wonderful concert and it's coming up this week. So things like that are coming into us that we really didn't have a focus for before. As you know, there are many different venues in Knoxville where we have a certain Civil War component, but we're all now getting together to try to make sure that we support each other and sponsor each other, promote each other's events, and this is one of the sites where that will be. Also in that regard, I think last time, for those who were here for the map lecture, this is Orlando Poe's wonderful map of the defenses with the sea of Knoxville. This map, thanks to Charles Reeves, who is a wonderful graphic artist, uh, has, we have the present day streets. So that you can look at this map, you can stand on any street in Knoxville and see exactly where you are in relation to the fortifications, the streets of 1864, the river, the railroad, all of those wonderful things. This is for sale. It's a fundraiser for the commission, and it's for sale up in the gift shop here for $20. It's 16 by 20, so it's easily frameable, and I think you need a little bigger frame for it, uh, but at any rate, it's standard size. So if anybody's interested, this is hours of fun, and now I will launch into the talk that you came to hear. Is the sound still coming through okay, okay up in the back? Okay. All right. The Civil War era is the first significant historic period for which, through the art of photographic portraiture, we can look into the faces of the everyday people whose lives were forever altered by events beyond their control. This was really the first time in history when average people, well, not everybody, but you had to be of certain affluence to afford to have your picture taken, but many did. And here in Knoxville, we had studios down on Gay Street from the earliest times that it was pretty much economically feasible, and those portraits are available to us to look into the, the, the faces of those people who lived here for those four years and before and beyond. The Civil War is four years, and we tend to think of it as a discrete event, but it was four years in the lives of people who had been here for 
many of them for most of their lives and many who continued afterwards. And it is very interesting to look at how that four years, which is, as I said, it's not just, it's just not, it's not a single thing that starts and ends in people's lives and, and, and somehow is, is not important to what came before and what came after. One minute history of Knoxville. Till the 1780s, East Tennessee was pretty much wilderness, and the native inhabitants liked it that way. However, progress in the form of European settlers came from the East Coast. Um, we have names like White, Blunt, Severe, McClung. The town of Knoxville was founded in 1786, interestingly named for Henry Knox, who'd never been here. I don't think he ever came. I think they were trying to get his attention. He was, uh, he was politically important in Washington to, Secretary of War, Dates. yeah, I, th I thought he was. And so anyway, we, uh, we came into being, the name was uh, to honor him. And um, so those were the men who founded the town in 1786. They were very prolific. Most of them married several times. And it was their children who were pretty much running the town in the 1860s. And it was their grandchildren who were the population of fighting age. Now, of course, that changed. As the war went on, men a lot older sometimes went into the, into the military and younger. But uh, in general, when the war started, it was going to be the grandchildren of the founding fathers who would be the, uh, the average age for soldiering. Statehood came in 1796, and Knoxville was the first capital. Uh, lost out to Nashville in 1817, and even then, of course, the differences between East and Middle and West Tennessee were becoming very obvious. And slavery, well, a very complicated topic. Uh, I just want to thank Blunt Mansion for support, uh, sponsoring yesterday a fascinating program on uh, some of the uh, history that we have locally about the African American populations. And uh, um, for the most part, our, the African American history did not get into the textbooks. And there are ways to go after it. One way is archaeologically. Dr. Charles Faulkner yesterday gave us a wonderful lecture about slave uh, quarters and excavating them behind Blunt Mansion. In any case, slavery. When we hear the story now about slavery, we hear there's not too much in East Tennessee, it's not that important, and that's true. However, it was also very generally accepted, and in, for most cases, most of the leading unionists were pro-slavery. And it was thought to be the natural order. The churches were in favor of it, and that's another whole dissertation topic. But in general, even though it was not economically underpinning our economy here, it was something that was not being contested. It was something that people considered to be um, pretty much the way things were, the way things ought to be, and the unionists felt that slavery was best protected under the Constitution. And that was one of the reasons that they chose to remain unionists. In any case, by 1860, Knoxville had a population of only 4,000 people. And in Knox County, uh, there were about, let's see, there are about 4,000 slaves and about 400 of free African Americans. And um, in, actually, in Knoxville itself, about 28% of the African American population were free. First families here, that is the descendants. And there were many descendants of those founding fathers held, still held most of the wealth. 5% of the free households held 66% of the wealth and 75% of them were slave owners. There is a wonderful book. I'm, I hope you all know of it. It is by a man named Robert Tracy McKenzie. It's called Lincolnites and Rebels. Everybody interested in Knoxville history should read this. It's full of de de details, primary research, excellent sources, and I've gotten a lot of my statistics out of there. But he, t he tells us that um, <clears throat> the population here was uh, the bottom 50% of the population held 1% of the wealth. So you can see it's pretty much top-heavy society. And in the lower uh, echelons of society, there was quite a lot of turnover. 
people who were here in, in one census were frequently gone in the next, that there was quite a turnover of, of, of family name and population. Many Northerners came down here to settle. It's not a new thing. There were, uh, after all, this was the frontier. The people who came here came from the east, came into uh, the jumping off point. Knoxville in the early days would be considered the edge of the frontier. Um, and some of the early names like Maynard and Dickinson, they came down, they were university educated, or Amherst College and uh, up in, in New England, came down here to teach at uh, East Tennessee uh, College. That was have to get straight where, when the name changed, but it, it's, it's the same university. We're sitting on the same location pretty much. These guys came down. Both of those men actually started at the university and noticed that they could make a whole lot more money doing other things. So they went into merchant. One, uh, Dickinson became a merchant, a wholesaler, and uh, Maynard got a law degree and went into politics. But they did start out teaching here at the university. Um, uh, Dickinson family, Maynard family, as I said, both of uh, uh, Dickinson married into the Cowan family, and uh, so he became um, part of the old, the old family names. And Maynard married very well, married Laura, I've forgotten her last name, but uh, he, she then moved here, and they were uh, lifelong residents of Knoxville. Um, the House family. Ellen Renshaw House left us a fascinating diary of her experiences from 63 through 65, and uh, they moved here from Georgia. When the railroads came into being and connected up pretty much in Knoxville, the Tennessee and Georgia Railroad, the Tennessee and Virginia Railroad, things were starting to get really quite prosperous. This was about 1858. So there were not many years for this prosperity to uh, actually flourish before the war came. But that railroad, the railroad made a very significant difference in the uh, economic functioning of this area. Also, there were many newcomers to town, many immigrants, Irish, Germans, English, Swiss, French, Scots, Italians. Um, you don't think of Knoxville, at least I hadn't necessarily thought of Knoxville as an immigrant town, but it has been and historically has been. And in, uh, this is from Rothrock. Mary Rothrock wrote one of the uh, still very valid good histories of Knoxville. It's a, uh, at any rate, her statistic was that there were 2,370 slaves in Knox County and 423 free African Americans in 1860 as the war started. Well, it started in 61, but anyway, the, 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 uh, in 1860 was when they took the census. Now, society in time of war, and it, this was war, and of course, in all wars, murder is basically legal depending on who you're killing and under the circumstances. It makes it a little difficult for the civilian population. Civilian and military authority. What is a cr crime in wartime? Yes, there are lots of manuals written, and, and everybody knows what supposed to be, but when it comes down to on the ground and people who are uh, marginally connected with military bushwhackers and, and kind of paramilitary organizations, it gets very fuzzy as to where the, what is a crime and, uh, and how the uh, threat and the security of the civilian population can be protected. And then who enforces the law? Who enforces the military side of the law? Who enforces the civilian side of the law? Who decides the punishment? Who carries it out? Who keeps the people safe? Women were left to fend for themselves. When the men went off to war to fight, women who were not there, when they got married, their property reverted to their husbands. They were not necessarily educated. They might get a polite uh, literary, literary degree, but they were not trained as bookkeepers and accountants and how to run the businesses that their husbands may leave behind, how to uh, manage a household. In fact, the women were very competent. We are not talking about a, a bunch of ladies who fell apart when this situation happened, but we are talking about people who were not trained and prepared for this kind of, of situation in their lives. Um, they could own property, but they did not work necessarily. They didn't hold office. They didn't manage family finances necessarily. And of course, they didn't vote. This was way before women's suffrage came in. Um, finance. Well, you think about credit, debt, money, mortgages. What happens when the whole monetary system flips? 
And what happens to your mortgage? Do you own, do you still own the Yankee Union sympathizer for that house that you bought? What if he's not accepting Confederate money? You know, there are, there are so many considerations when you think about how to run a society in the midst of war and with people on both sides of that issue as it was so prominently important for the, the fact that everybody here was uh, almost half and half divided in the city of Knoxville in terms of their loyalties. Anyway, you think of the loss of property, think of income. Our, if you're going to get paid now, are you going to get paid by, with Confederate dollars? Well, pretty much, yeah. If you're living here, uh, if you're going to move back up to the outside of this area uh, where the uh, um, federal money is still being, uh, of course, it's still the federal money, but, but that, that whole idea of what happens to your own personal wealth, your own personal economic stability in a time of war. Um, and, of course, there's the physical danger. That needs to be considered. Overcrowding, it's not just military. In fact, military danger is the least of it. You're talking about overcrowding, disease, starvation, medical shortages, and just plain violence. All of these things came to town when war did. And, of course, what does it mean to have an army and then refugees in town? If you're looking at 4,000, 16,000, 20,000 plus people who come to town, they need to be fed, they need to be sheltered, and they're nonproductive. They're not growing food. They're not making stuff to support the population. And then just the physical drain on basic services. There's no storage system. There's no indoor plumbing. There's no garbage removal. Horses and mules and cavalry. Uh, you know, you basically everybody, when the parade goes down the street in the middle of Gay Street these days, we, we have a tiny little bit of experience of what it must have been like up and down Gay Street and all streets in town. And, uh, of course, the, all the major buildings, the hospitals, the churches, anything with a big roof and some floor space uh, potentially is filled with casualties from one action or another. All of the major buildings were taken over by the military. And so all of these things are happening in your hometown. Also, there is no home front. In the north, in the deep south, it was really a distant war, at least in the beginning and for the first few years. The fathers and the sons and the husbands left to fight elsewhere. Day-to-day -day life went on, and there's no buffer, but there is a buffer. There's a buffer of space, and there is no physical threat. And importantly, the community ethos supports and values the sacrifice of the family. So there is that idea that if, some, if the family has the breadwinner is gone or whatever male relatives have gone off to fight, that there is an empathy and community support for that family. However, imagine when you're surrounded by people and you're watching husbands and, wives, husbands and, and brothers and sons go off to fight knowing that they're going off to kill each other. They, that half the town is going to go off for one side and half the town is going to go off the other, and those statistics are a little soft. But, but in any case, these people are going out to support two sides of this war. And at home, you're watching as the, your friends, your family, your neighbors, people you've known all your lives turn into the enemy. And where is the community support then? Ter it, it, the, you must, it's really hard to imagine the psychological abuse that is, really, in terms of how do you live, how do you get through your days? How do you get up in the morning and look out at the world and, and, and get that kind of balance that is gone now with this war? And even though they may be going elsewhere to fight in the early days, we know that, uh, that they are going out to fight each other. And then the emotional turmoil, turmoil of being surrounded by the enemy. And in Knoxville, social institutions all were affected. Schools, churches, commerce, neighbors, families. It was neutral. And of course, then after when the Confederate draft comes in, for a while, some people thought, well, I'm just going to stick this out. You know, in the beginning, nobody knew how long it was going to last. People thought, oh, there'll be a few battles, and it'll be lots of fun, and we'll have some glory and chivalry, and then, then it'll be resolved, and it'll be all over. Nobody knew how long it was going to take, how terrible it was going to be. And some people did. They say perhaps that's why Sherman 
uh, William Tecumseh Sherman's have to break down early in the war. He knew what this war would come to before it was over. And, um, but most people had a very optimistic, naive view of what war was. And um, so anyway, the uh, uh, Confederate draft made it necessary for people to say which side they were on and say it kind of publicly. Because either you went off to fight for the Confederate Army or you got out of town, went north somewhere else to join up, for the, uh, join up with the Union Army. You couldn't just stay here and be neutral. It was no longer possible to just kind of ride it out. Um, also, when these East Tennessee Confederate troops did sign up, they were sent elsewhere. Uh, for some reason, Richmond seemed to think that armed and organized East Tennesseans in their own home territory was not a good idea. That maybe they were going to take a little more supervision than they, uh, than they were willing to give. So these troops were not allowed to stay here and defend their own homes and families. They were sent elsewhere. And so the troops, the Confederate troops that were here, were from elsewhere. And they were uh, hostile in some ways to the East Tennessee population because they knew that so many people here were Unionists. And so they didn't quite trust East Tennessee. And that's another layer of uncertainty and tension at, on, on, in town at that time. And finally, as I said, federal volunteers did flee to Kentucky, and many of them did join the federal army, and some of them did come back in 1863 when the Union took the town over again. But all of this stuff is, uh, well... It's so, such a complex story and so many layers of, uh, as of tension and conflict over and above just two armies coming together to fight each other on a field of battle. All right. Web of kinship. You know, that bottom expression, he's kin but I don't claim him. I never heard that before I came to East Tennessee. <laughs> there are places in the world where that sentence would mean nothing, <laughs> but here it does. And, and <laughs> kinship is a special thing in East Tennessee, and it continues to be. So you can imagine that it was during the war. It's interesting, too, it was so complicated, it was so interconnected. I, I'm still puzzling over reading, trying to figure out what did that web of kinship mean. If you're related to everybody, what does that mean? And of course, people know who they're related to and who they aren't related to. That's, that's something people all know about their own families. But it's very hard to puzzle out when you're an outsider, obviously, as I am. So let's look at some of these families. First of all, the McClungs. And I'm starting with the McClungs because this is the Frank H. McClung Museum, and we've got a ton of McClung papers and everything, as does the McClung Collection, the McClung Col Historical Collection. We're, we are uh, frequently um, confused one to the other, and obvious reasons we have the same name. The McClung Historical Collection is down on Gay Street. It's part of the Knox County Public Library System. Anybody who is interested in doing East Tennessee family research needs to know about that place. It's a treasure trove. They do classes on how to research genealogy. And lately, uh, uh, Dr. Sh uh, Schweitzer? Schweitzer has been doing a class on um, Civil War genealogy, how to explore records. There, are, there is so much available online now. Uh, it's not a matter anymore of having to write a letter and send it to Washington and hoping, hoping somebody photocopies the right records the first time and that sort of thing. It's a lot easier. There's still some of that, but it's a lot easier now than it ever was to get some good information about uh, ancestors in the past. The McClung's here. This museum was uh, built, opened in the early 60s. It was a donation from Ellen McClung Green. Ellen was Frank H. McClung's daughter, the youngest of his 10 children. Calvin McClung, who was also, he was Frank's son, Ellen's brother, he started the McClung Collection down on Gay Street. So that's how those two 
those two collections happen to uh, come together. Special collections at the University of Tennessee, which is over in the library building, also have wonderful primary materials. Again, if you're interested in research, doing primary document research, that's another place that, that you, you can't miss. Doing primary document research is very tedious and time consuming, and you can spend a whole day and come up with maybe one iffy fact. Uh, but it's so rewarding when you do find out uh, you know, there are just things that come out that all of a sudden you have an aha moment and it, and it makes it all worth the time. Here at the McClung Museum, we are descended from Charles McClung just like everybody, all the McClungs in East Tennessee were. He, came, he was one of those founding fathers. He came here um, in 1788. He was the original surveyor. Apparently he had about six weeks of training. <laughs> But that was enough to get him through what he had to do, and he surveyed the original downtown grid, which is exactly today as it was. Um, he built State's View out on Ebenezer Road. Um, everybody familiar with? You know, it's up at the top of the hill out there where George Williams Road come in. They just put a traffic light in the uh, upstairs window, basically, um, which seems like a crime to me, but that is the home that was built by Charles McClung. And I believe in Ellen's papers, I don't think they called it State's View. It was a uh, Fruit View or Fruit. Does anybody know the name? It's, another, it's a different name. She calls it Fruit View, I believe, or Fruit, fruit Dale. But not, she do, in none of her papers does she refer to this home as uh, State's View. Um, in any case, he married Margaret White, who was the daughter of uh, James White, who built the fort, another one of those early names. They had nine children. When she died, he married Rebecca Williams. And of course, Williams is another longtime Knoxville name. They had three more children. Charles and Margaret had a son named Matthew. Matthew married Eliza Morgan, and they had ten children. And Frank was number five. Frank H. McClung is my, is when you go into genealogy, which I have done just a little bit, and I'm not a genealogist, but I use Frank as the ego and try to figure out from how, how was somebody related to Frank. And it, it makes it a little bit more, uh, it's a little easier to understand that way. Um, anyway, Frank was number five of those ten children, and he had a brother named Hugh Lawson White McClung. Uh, who, wait a minute. Hugh Lawson McClung, who was number 10. All right, so we're going to use Frank as our ego when we look at the genealogy. Now, when the war came, there were a lot of McClungs in town. There were actually quite a few males, McClungs, of the, the uh, right age to go into the Army. They all chose the Confederacy. The McClungs were merchants, and with the opening of the railroad, they, had, they were wholesalers, and when the railroad opened up, they had a great uh, new market, and they tended to concentrate on the southern and western market. In fact, Frank married a woman from uh, St. Louis, and uh, he continued in the wholesale business through the war, pretty much. Um, and so all of the McClungs decided to go with the Confederacy. And there, I just have four of the that I've, that I've found a little bit more out about. Uncle Hugh Lawson White McClung. Now, he is a brother of Matthew's. He is Frank's uncle. He was 51 when the war started. He was very wealthy. He was not of the age to go into service. And he was also, he had two young children with his second wife. So he had, uh, I think, about six or seven children with his first wife and his two with the second wife. He was conflicted, and he's left letters. He's written letters that exist in primary document collections, and he said he, he hadn't really decided what he wanted to do. But when Lincoln called for troops, and this was a defining point in many men's decisions, when Lincoln called for troops, volunteers to fight against the South, then he made his mind up to go with the state of Tennessee. So he then later got uh, the contract with the state of Tennessee to produce salt. Saltville, Virginia was a very important location. Saltville was, uh, it was one of the few sites in the south where there was salt. Salt had been imported. Much of the salt had been imported. But when the blockade went up on the coast, the Union was blockading the southern ports, they had to look for sites interior for salt. And Saltville was one. So uh, Frank 
now Hugh Lawson White McClung and his partner Joseph Jakes, who later became mayor of Knoxville, uh, they got the contract to run the business up there in, in Saltville. Start, and he went, actually went up there in 63 when the Confederates moved out and the, and the Union moved in. Now Frank H., when the war started, was 35. He had five children. He was an established merchant. And 35 was pretty much middle age then. So he was probably not going to go into active service either. In fact, he became an ordinance officer, a clerk. He stayed in Knoxville. Uh, and he went in uh, August of 63. They knew that the Federals were coming. He went to Saltville. And his work in, in Saltville was a draft-exempt position. Pleasant Miller McClung. This is a first cousin of Frank's. He was 37 with four children. He also became an ordinance officer in Knoxville, and he was, had the rank of captain. He never left town, but he died in battle in 1863. And the fourth, Brother Hugh, this, he was 22 years old, and he couldn't wait to enlist. He joined up, and he joined early the 26th Tennessee Infantry, rank of captain. This is also called the 3rd East Tennessee. The numbers change. And so here we have four different men who had to make choices. They all decided to side with the uh, Confederacy, and... This is a, just a little synopsis of, of where they were in their lives and the choices they made. This is a picture of Uncle Hugh Lawson White McClung. Um, this was down in Frank, and this is one I've found since the lecture last year. I don't know how many were here a year ago. I don't remember what I said last year, so <laughs> if, if you remember <laughs> every, everything I said, this is new. Um, the, he, he is a... Is a wealthy man, he is a man of business, um, and he is this, is, this is what Uncle Frank looks like. He also, he married uh, a, a woman named Rachel Morgan, and Frank's father married Eliza Morgan, and I believe they were cousins. So already at this level, we're getting the cousins marrying cousins. Um, this is Frank McClung. Uh, when I we started working on the lecture up here, uh, not the lecture, the uh, exhibit that opened in 2007, um, none of us knew much about Frank. We knew that the museum was donated in his, in his name, but the details of his life were, were really not well known. But we knew his obituary, and his obituary did not even mention the recent unpleasantness. So that, you know... It, it, he did not take, he did not identify with what he did during the war. It's certainly not enough to put it into his obituary, or his family didn't put it into his obituary. His cousin Pless, I believe Pless is a nickname for Pleasant, um, but with McClung's, you, you can go out to three middle names, Hugh Lawson White McClung. There were four of them in town in, in the 1860s, so you can't be sure that you've got the right one until you do a lot of deep, digging for details. At any rate, this is pretty much what Frank looked like. This is just a little bit after the war. And this is his handsome younger, youngest brother. He was the ninth of Matthew and Eliza's ten children. He went into the infantry at age 22. He was a captain in Company F. The results of their decision. Frank returned to Knoxville from Saltville. He was pardoned. They had five more children. He lived to be 70 years old, and he died as a respected, very successful citizen. Cousin Pleasant bled to death on June 19, 1863. He had his legs blown off below the knees by Sanders. This is Sanders of Fort Sanders, but in 63 June, he was Colonel Sanders, and he came down with uh, cavalry from Kentucky attacked Knoxville with artillery. There was an exchange of, of gunfire. Um, the high points here in town were uh, the, the Confederate artillery had the high points. They exchanged so shots back and forth. And um, it was over after not, not very long. But during that short time, we managed to lose one of the McClungs, and that was Captain Pleasant McClung. Frequently in the records they say Captain McClung died and they, the records mix up another McClung and I'll, I'll tell you about him. He's coming right up. Now Uncle Hugh prospered during the war. He's pretty much selling salt. When he wrote his uh, pardon, 
he made a point of saying that he hardly made any profit at all and he sold, the po he sold most of the salt to civilians. So he lived to be 81 and uh, lived, a, lived, a, lived a pretty good life. And Brother Hugh, he died February 1862 at the Battle of Fort Donelson, leading his men. He had turned 23 in December. He was killed in February. And he was one of the first Knoxvillians, certainly a Knoxvillian that people knew um, because he was one of the old families. It was the first time that the war hit home with the death of, of, one, of the, one of the McClungs. Now, Franklin Henry McClung, he was a merchant, property owner, husband, father, church member. He belonged to St. John's Episcopal Church, as did many of the prominent Confederate families. Um, and he was a grandson of Knoxville's founding fathers. And he was one of those people who was wealthy enough to have his picture taken regularly. This is the first one we have of Frank. It's just after the war, he looks a little bit older, a little bit more tired. Frank ages very well. <laughs> and at some of these, you look at him and you think, he looks like he's had some work done. I think his eyes have been <laughs> Very dapper, very dapper into, into his old age. This was in September of... 97, he died in 98, in early 98. When he wrote his request for pardon, he um, had to send a letter directly to Andrew Johnson, who was the president. Uh, he had to write a personal letter because he was worth more than $20,000, and um, also because he was out of town in Virginia when some of the original uh, uh, when the, part, the general amnesty was declared. Also, he was arrested when he got back for being a rebel, um, but that he was, he was not held very long. And so he explained uh, that he was, he, he acted as a clerk in an ordinance office established by the so-called Confederate States. So sounds, sounds familiar, doesn't it? He was just doing his job. He was the only clerk. And across his, uh, his we have a photocopy of his original letter requesting a pardon. And in pencil it says, the petitioner was a very active and influential rebel, exerted his influence actively against the government, went into rebellion at the start, and continued until the, until the surrender. Do not pardon. Brownlow. <laughs> Frank did, however, receive his pardon, and on the way out we have it posted. We, it's part of our exhibit up here. So Frank signed, got his pardon and uh, went back to living the life that he had lived before, and pretty much that was that in terms of his, he never seemed to refer to the war again. He died in May of 98, and he and his wife Eliza were buried in Old Gray Cemetery, as are most of these people. Now, this, these are the only two pictures known of um, uh, William Price Sanders. Uh, last week, or last month, I talked a little bit about how he and Poe were best friends, how they had been friends at uh, um, West Point together. Well, it was in June of 63 that Sanders and Cavalry came down from Kentucky, and uh, they actually uh, went to Lenore City. It's part of Lenore City was the mill was uh, burned, and then they came up through Kingston Pike. They cut the telegraph line, and so here in Knoxville, they didn't hear that Sanders was on his way, except, of course, they did eventually. And Sanders got to town, um, went out from the north side, threw shells into town, and that was, that was the raid. Um, it was the long-feared and dreaded federal attack. People here, of course, knew that there were uh, troops just over the Kentucky line. They always felt vulnerable, and this was the first time that the, those Confederate troops, uh, federal troops actually got to town. Um, inside the town, Simon Bolivar Buckner was the Confederate general who was here. Um, he, he was in Clinton when this attack was, uh, was, was about to happen. So in town, there was only one regiment of regulars, and also uh, invalids and citizens were 
manning the, uh, the, the defenses of the town. And they did manage to pull it all together. And after the whole thing was over, Sanders wrote a sweet note. He said, if it hadn't been for the fine way that you handled your artillery today, I might have taken the town. Sincerely, William P. Sanders. I, I always thought that was very nice, a thank you note for a very nice <laughs> artillery exchange. <laughs> There were two and perhaps three Captain McClungs who participated in this defense of the town. Pleasant Miller, we already heard about him. He was Frank's cousin. He was hit by an artillery shell on Summit Hill. Uh, his legs were blown off. He was attended to by Reverend Humes, who ironically was the same one who was with Sanders at the end in, in uh, well, in six months or so when Sanders died here in town. It was Humes who was with him. And there was another minister also, but he was, uh, he was at both of these uh, deaths. And Frank H. was in town. We're pretty sure. Uh, now, I've, we've got letters downstairs, and I'm trying to cross-reference where they were mailed from and at what the time and date, but I'm pretty sure that Frank was in town. And I imagine that he, and, he along with Pleasant, was probably out there. There were 200 or so townsfolk who defended the lines. And in the uh, report in the paper the next day or so, um, it said that most, many of them did not want their names published. And I suspect that maybe Frank was one of them, but I'm not sure entirely. In any case, Frank could not help but have been affected by the death of his cousin right there in his own hometown, um, basically playing the same role in the military that Frank was. Frank left town, uh, this, this happened in June, and Frank left town in August to go up to Saltville. Now, the other person in town who was involved in this is Hugh Lawson White McClung. He's from Huntsville, Alabama. So I said, there were four Hugh Lawson White McClungs in town, and you, you really have to keep a scorecard to figure out which one it was involved. Hugh Lawson White McClung from Alabama was not killed at this inter interaction, at this military exchange. He, in fact, was on the line. He was a trained artillerist. He started McClung's battery. Sometimes in the history it says that it was Hugh Lawson White, 51 years old, who started McClung's battery. That's not true. It was this guy from Alabama who started the battery. And uh, he was actually in town because he was in jail. Uh, he was the son of James White McClung. This is Frank's father's brother, son of Charles. And uh, James moved to Huntsville, Alabama. He married three times, had many children. And it says uh, James White McClung, state representative, shot and killed Andrew Wiles, editor of the Huntsville Democrat, in a duel over the publication of an article that criticized McClung's conduct. They were, they were kind of while down there in Alabama, I'm guessing. I don't know that part of the world too well myself, but it seems like. Anyway, Hugh Lawson White McClung from Alabama was a West Point graduate. He was a civil engineer. He raised an artillery unit in Knoxville in uh, uh, early 61, well, the summer of 61. And um, there was a notice in the paper, for instance, in August of 61, asking for volunteers for McClung's battery. He came here with his half-brother, Elliot Spotswood McClung. Elliot was uh, the son of James's second marriage. So Hugh Lawson White McClung, Alabama, and Elliot Spotswood McClung, Alabama, are half-brothers. And interestingly, Elliot's full sister, who is James' half-sister, married Pleasant. Remember Pleasant, who just died up at the... Uh, at the in, so, and, and Pleasant, so Pleasant and Mary Ann were first cousins. So her name was Mary Ann Cameron McClung McClung. <laughs> Again, not easy to keep straight. <laughs> this is just a little bit of the uh, court martial. Poor, I, I don't know, Hugh, Hugh Lawson White McClung, Alabama, had some tough times in the Army. I think that he and Elliot Spotswood called Uncle well, he's called Cousin Spot almost for the rest of his life. So he and Cousin Spot are having a little trouble with authority. And um, 
uh, Hugh ends up in jail. He's here waiting court-martial when the Yankees come calling. And this says that, uh, I won't read the whole thing, but anyway, he volunteers, he's accused, and they decide that it was the, uh, more of a crime of um, things that he didn't do more than things that he did, and that he'd learned his lesson and that he proved himself. He was, his offer was accepted. He acted gallantly and ga with gallantry and courage, and such good contact was such good conduct is worthy of a good soldier and merits leniency. So the narrow escape he has made will persuade the accused of the necessity of attempting to redeem the past by active and faithful attention to duty in the future. The sentence is remitted and the accused reports was battery for duty. So because he volunteered to defend the town and he was a trained artillerist, he's out on the front lines, he, he was actually convicted of several of the, of the charges. Uh, I I think that drunkenness and dereliction of duty, he, he thought that wasn't, <laughs> that, that was a rumor, just abs absolutely rumor. He wasn't, those things he did not get convicted of. After he participated in this event here, he went back to his battery, um, and he was with John Hunt Morgan when John Hunt Morgan was killed up in Greenville. And in Morristown, uh, Hugh Lawson White McClung from Alabama was captured in November of 64 with many of his, the men in his battery, and he was sent to Johnson Island. He, that was a camp for, uh, 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 prison camp for officers up in Ohio. And let me tell you a little bit more about Hugh Lawson White McClung. He, in the official reports, he says things like, McClung attacked, even though he was told to wait for orders. Luckily, it turned out well, and and they, they did well in that particular engagement. Or he keeps losing his artillery. They, they have to leave the guns behind, or they have to leave the caissons behind. So he's frequently, he reports, but he ha does, it's McClung's artillery without guns. That's a, he's ordered to Port Hudson in Louisiana, but he never does show up. He shows up at Shiloh, even though he wasn't ordered to go there, and he, but he, he showed up for a gun, with, with, a, with guns. You know, of course, they were going to put him in the right spot, and he did very very well there, performed very bravely. Um, and as I said, the court martial did have some things like drunkenness, dereliction of duty, a few pay payroll issues. I just think he wasn't good with details because he was very, very brave. And the original verdict said he would forfeit his pay and be dismissed for service, but he redeemed himself and went on. As I said, and he also was a West Pointer, an engineer, but he didn't ever rise above the rank of captain. And I had this whole mental image of a guy who was just anti-authority and, and kind of kind of a loose cannon, if you'll excuse the term. But um, when I went to look at the records up in Washington, there is, in fact, a whole uh, interchange, whole correspondence where he is looking for promotion, and, and he seems a lot more by the book in that correspondence than these facts would, uh, uh, would, would seem to indicate. So it needs a lot more research. So uh, somebody could do a nice master's thesis on this man and his career. Anyway, he was with, apparently with John Hunt Morgan, who was a distant relative through Frank's mother. The Morgans and the McClungs were related. And he was captured in Morristown, spent the rest of the war in Johnson Island. One way we know about this is this wonderful letter that's downstairs in our collection, and this is not published, hasn't really been seen. You can see up at the top, it is from Johnson's Island, and it's signed Hugh and it's to dear Frank, and it's addressed to Frank at McClung and Jake's in Saltville. This very nicely confirms where he was, where Frank was, and the letter just kind of talks about some of the things going on. For one thing, Frank's house is being confiscated in Knoxville as rebel property. He's got a wife and five kids in that house, and this is a bit of a problem, and uh, to his brother, and apparently in some regards, however much that uh, Hugh here could help from prison camp, he's advising Lida, L-I-D-A, Lida, Lida, anyway, that's Eliza's nickname. He's it's trying to help her a little bit, figure out how they're going to uh, deal with this particular, uh, well, it's a money problem, basically, but the house could be confiscated and could be sold, and the contents could be sold, and there's a letter from uh, uh, one of Frank's brothers saying, it really would have been nice if everything had been in your name in the first place, he's saying to the wife. Well, that didn't happen too much. 
You know, you don't think ahead, thinking that war is going to come in town. You better put everything in the wife's name. But so they, they were dealing with those kinds of financial issues. Um, Elliot spots with McClung. As I said, he was Hugh's half-brother. He came up from Alabama. Um, and his sister, Mary Ann, married Pleasant, so she was already up here. Uh, he was a lieutenant in McClung's battery. And he was cashiered. Now, the Confederate Army wanted, needed officers. Uh, they, <laughs> I can't imagine how bad it must have been because they threw him out. I mean, cashiered means you're gone. And they put a notice in the paper saying so down at the Chattanooga Daily Rebel. There's a nice little notice that says E.S. McClung is uh, cashiered for making a false muster roll. I don't think he stopped fighting, though. Even though he was officially out, he kept showing up for engagements, so he was still still pretty much of a soldier. And again, he's one of those interesting personalities where the details need to be pulled together to, to flesh out this, um, you know. First impressions may not be uh, exact, so he, he, he deserves more of a hearing, I think. But, uh, and I haven't been able to find a photograph of Hugh Lawson White McClung from Alabama. I think a road trip down to Huntsville, maybe I could find a picture of him. But downstairs, there's Cousin Spot. Doesn't it look like he just slicked his hair back for the picture? <laughs> He's uh, Elliot Spotswood McClung. He stays in Knoxville after the war. He becomes very close with Frank's family. And forever after, he is Cousin Spot. He's never Elliot or any other name. It's always Cousin, and never just Spot, always Cousin Spot. And this is Cousin Spot's wife. Patty Booth McClung. They married in 1866, right after the war. She's not from Knoxville, but she moves to Knoxville with him. And they live here, both of them live, uh, let's see, I think that both of them live almost to 1900 or just a little bit past. And it's interesting with, with Patty, she seems a little flashier than the other McClung women. You know, she's got her hair piled up and the comb on top and more ruffles and that sort of thing. And uh, she lived a few years longer than he did. Um, and in her obituary, and I always, I always thought that, you know, 2011, um, there, the, the, you know, there's a campaign for breast cancer awareness and all of that. But it says right in her obituary that she died of breast cancer. It's not it's kind of a hidden fact. It's just stated very clearly that that was the cause of death. Now, McClung women, Eliza Ann Mills. She came from St. Louis, Missouri. She's Frank's wife. Uh, she's the daughter of a banker. And uh, they like to point out that at one time he did employ a lawyer to represent his interest in Illinois. A. Lincoln was his lawyer for, for a while in the early days. Frank's mother was also named Eliza Jane. So Eliza Ann, Eliza Jane, Mills and Morgan, it's very easy to get these two ladies confused because frequently they're just called Eliza. So keeping the generation straight is complicated here. But Eliza Jane was uh, Frank's mother and also the son, the mother of Hugh, who was killed at 23 at Fort Donaldson. She's also mentioned several times in Ellen House's diary, referred to as the poor old lady and when she donates her son's blankets to be used in the Confederate hospital and jail. Um, she has a number, she was a, she was a diarist, we have her diaries, and she starts every, every entry off with a weather report, and then she says who died on that day. She lost siblings, she lost children, and almost every day of the year there is somebody whose anniversary of death it is, and she ma mentions that in her diary. She's particularly um, very uh, focused on the death of her 37-year-old son, Cal, wait a minute. Yes, Calvin. This was would have been Frank's older brother, and then Frank himself had a Calvin who was a son. But Frank's older brother, Calvin, died at age 37, and his name appears frequently in his mother's uh, diary. She also writes about Hugh, and she says in the, in the letters that he's He's a good boy. He's 22. He's uh, finishing up college. He wants to go to Princeton, wants to do a full course at Princeton, but she thinks he needs to come back and work in the family business for a while, learn the value of money, and that he is uh, sometimes prone to boyish indiscretions. Not sure what that means, but 
and she's widowed by that time, so she's raising this you know, young man on her own. Um, Frank, uh, Hugh is the second to youngest. There's also a sister, Ellen, who is Frank's youngest sister. Uh, Matilda Mills uh, McClung, Tilly, is Frank and Eliza's first daughter. And she dies at age 14. I haven't found out why, but in, the, in this day and age, before antibiotics, appendicitis will kill you. Uh, any kind of an infection may be lethal. Um, there was still typhoid, smallpox, those kinds of diseases were, could take otherwise healthy young adults. And then there's Ellen Marshall McClung Green. That's the lady who donated the money for this museum. This is Eliza. This is Frank's mother. She was married at age 16, had 10 children, and uh, she was the one who lost her youngest son to the battle. This is her 10th child. This is the uh, uh, sister of Frank, Ellen McClung. She was a friend of Ellen House's, and she is one of the, uh, uh, the she rebels that Brownlow later talks about. She's very much pro-Confederate as many of the young women were here in town. And that's a whole, another whole story is about the ladies in town and the uh, uh, participation that they had in the, in the war effort. Now, Frank was born in Blunt Mansion. Blunt Mansion, of course, we know for its uh, Revolutionary War Association, but he was uh, uh, the fifth of 10 children. He was born there. Uh, they did not own the house during the Civil War. The, the uh, Boyd family did, but this is where this would have been his childhood home. He, they, Frank then moved to this residence at Cumberland and Walnut. Those are two different views of the same house. This is where Eliza lived during the war uh, for the, the four years, although she did travel some also, even with five children. And this is a wonderful map of downtown where the red arrow is. Now off to the right, this corner up here, this is the uh, Second Presbyterian Church, and then this is the Methodist Church, and this is near where the present-day post office is. This is where Frank's house was downtown. These pictures are wonderful because they have so much detail. When you enlarge them, you don't just get big pixel. You get more detail of the, of the places and, and the features on them. This is wife's, wife of Frank. Her name was Eliza Mill McCl Mills McClung. Um, she stayed in Knoxville when Frank left in 63, and she had five and six small children during the war here in Knoxville. And she had her picture taken regularly. This is Calvin. This is the man who started the McClung Collection downtown. And this is baby Eliza, who didn't make it past a year. So many children died, so many well, that's another whole topic, too. These ladies were amazingly caught up in uh, child bearing, child rearing, and very sadly, child burying. There were so many children that died. You see her getting a little older and more tired. This is the last photograph that we have of her. That's a picture of Frank, the locket, the, pin, the brooch at her neck. This is her daughter, Tilly. Tilly apparently was everybody's favorite. She's the one who died at 14. She's that buried in Old Gray Cemetery. Her portrait was painted by Lloyd Branson. I like this picture. He's doing a picture of himself here. And of course, Lloyd Branson is a very well-known local artist. He did this painting of Tilly, and it hangs outside the president's office in the tower over here. So if you're ever up there and you see this picture, you'll know what the story is. It was painted, actually it was painted from the photograph here. Right over here, you can see the image of her. This is where it was painted. And she is at Old Gray Cemetery. And interestingly, her brother, now after, now remember Frank, it was in the war, and he comes home, he gets pardoned, leads a good life. His son becomes treasurer of the United States under Taft. And... There's a wonderful article by Jack Neely in Metropulse, 2009, if you want to read details of Frank's life. Fascinating life. He died young, died of typhoid over in, uh, I think he was in England, and, and came back, never married. Um, but there's a correspondence downstairs 
and he says uh, in the first letter here that he was going through the old house with his brother and they found a daguerreotype which was taken by this man, with, uh, of this man and Tilly, a little sister of mine. When you were a visitor in 1863-64, you were stationed in Knoxville and you had quarters at my father's house. This is the occupying army that's staying at, her, at his house and for some reason they go downtown and they have their photograph taken together, the little girl and the officer, and years later brother is saying, thought you might like a copy of this and he says, oh it's a pleasure meeting you, thank you very much for the picture. Again, it's that oh what a lovely war kind of concept of, unfortunately I haven't yet found the picture of Tilly and the general. But as, as I said, she was, seemed to be a very charismatic little person and, and the kind of person that would be remembered this way. This is Frank's post-war home at Church and Locust. Quite a place, very palatial. This is a picture of Ellen's wedding. <laughs> it doesn't look like a lot of fun to me, but I think it was the high-style Classic, you know, high class wedding of the eight, of 1895. Ellen Marshall McClung Green, and she she had her picture taken every year of her life. We'll go through, watch her grow up. Is that a wonderful picture? That wedding dress just doesn't seem to suit her. She seems very studious, very, um, you know, and the, the dress is uh, very frilly, ruffly. You know, they can do this with special effects in Hollywood, but this is a real person. You know, somebody who's not in the history books is her whole life documented in portraiture. Ellen and Judge Green uh, never did have children, and Ellen seemed to be obsessed with the past and with her family's history. In this picture, in 1898, she dressed up in her mother's clothes with the same jewelry, the same earrings. She did her hair the same way. And she sent this picture to a number of her mother's old friends to, and asked, do I look like her? And it was Ellen who collected so much of what we have here in our collection and what's over at Special Collections. She died at the age of 86, and she and Judge Green are in Old Gray Cemetery. I could stop here. I have one more story. Do you want me to go on? Okay. All right. This couple, I just think these are wonderful. Just to, to kind of a, could be a classic representation of the Old South. They're from Oxford, Mississippi. And his name is Francis Marion Green. Wonderful Revolutionary War reference. He started a, a, the rifles, oh, I forget the regiment number, but the, the rifles from Oxford, Mississippi, and went into the war. He left his wife with two small boys, one was Judge Green, and uh, he went to war. He ended up, whoops, went the wrong way. He ended up in Spotsylvania, Virginia in 1864. He was mortally wounded, and he got, his wife got this four-page letter from the chaplain. And this is one of those classic perfect death scenarios. Uh, there is a wonderful book here. I'm going to skip down to this book by Drew Gilpin Faust. She's the new president of Harvard, first lady president of Harvard. And she wrote a book called Republic of Suffering. And it talks about how the American culture absorbed this incredible uh, overwhelming death in mass of the men of the population away from home where you could not go through the, the, the established rituals of funeral and wake and, and religious service and all of that. And um, this letter is quite representative of 
what she was talking about because it does talk about this is from the chaplain and it's to uh, to Mrs. Green and it talks about the, the perfect death and, he, and of course as many did at those times they li they lingered for days knowing they were dying and, and that's what happened with him this is the his grave you can't read it too well but it does say Francis M Green and it's in Middlesburg Virginia and when I first read this book, I, of course, was very impressed with her scholarship and with all that uh, goes along with researching the primary documents, and it's a very important topic. And this is the dedication, McGee Tyson Gilpin. And you think, whoa, that's, that sounds very familiar. It turns out that she is the great-granddaughter of General Tyson, that Tyson was married to Betty Humes McGee. And, of course, the Humes, the McGees, the McClungs. And her sister was married to one of Frank's sons, I believe. I'd have to check that out again. At any rate, again, the interrelationship of the families are amazing. I wrote to Dr. Faust, asked her to come talk to us, and she's busy. <laughs> but she sent me a nice little note that said, thanks for asking. So maybe in the four years of our uh, uh, sesquicentennial celebration, we can... Uh, entice her to come down to talk. She's a first-rate scholar, and her ties to Knoxville are really quite close. And I've talked way over my time again. Thank you. <laughs> oh, put the lights on. <laughs>